All right, we're in 2 Peter chapter 3. How many of you got a bulletin this morning? I want you to open up the bulletin and look at that picture in there. It's all going to make sense here in a minute. <laughs> look at the picture in the bulletin and then remember that as I, as I tell this little story. The year was 1985. I met this very pretty, very shy, very quiet young lady while cruising the square in Ava. Of course, they don't get to do that anymore, but back then that was the thing to do. You cruised the square and picked up chicks. And uh, not long after I, I met this, this pretty young lady up on the square, we began to date. Um, we had a, a whirlwind of a relationship. Uh, we hit it off very nicely. And uh, I found out that she was a very strong Christian lady. And for me to date her, I had to go to church. Uh, at best, I was lukewarm as a Christian. That's at best. Uh, we dated for a little over a year and a half. And uh, like most ignorant 17-year-olds, I didn't realize what I had. And uh, this young lady and I began, I didn't realize what I had in this young lady. And then I began to do some ignorant stuff. And it wasn't long before that she broke up with me. And uh, which was fine with me because uh, I had a very elevated view of myself at 17 years old, and I thought I could find somebody better. Well, I spent a whole summer apart. She dated others, I dated others, and at the beginning of her senior year, we decided to try it one more time. Uh, but I had this idea that I was doing her a favor. I, I'm just being honest here. Uh, I hate to admit it, but I was a total jerk. I was, a, I was a real jerk to her. I treated her awful. Uh, I treated her like she owed me something. And um, not long after that, not long after we got back together, we broke up again. It wasn't very long. Uh, but I had heard through the grapevine that there was a, another young lady that my now ex did not like. And so uh, guess who I began to pursue? And uh, I began to date this other young lady with the whole sole purpose of making my ex jealous. And every chance I would got, get, I would flaunt this new girlfriend in front of my ex-girlfriend. Every day at lunch, I would go over to the school in the school parking lot, and we would sit out in the parking lot and, and eat lunch. Uh, I gave her my class ring. I gave her my letterman's jacket, which I, I heard that she flaunted it quite well also. Uh, well, one day at lunch, as I was sitting out there with my girlfriend, I saw my ex coming in my direction. Now, I was so arrogant. I was so cocky. I was fully convinced she was coming to beg me to come back to her. Uh, she came directly to my car, and she asked if she could s speak with me, to which I stepped out of the car, and she handed me an envelope. Now, inside the envelope was something that rattled. I couldn't tell exactly what it was, to which I found out later was a necklace that I had bought her that she had broke up into a thousand pieces. Um, and while I was distracted uh, with this envelope... Um, this very pretty, this very shy, this very shy young lady uh, sucker punched me. She drew back and threw a haymaker to the left side of my face. Now, I can honestly say I have never been hit that hard by a dude. Never. She caught me off guard, and she knocked the pimples right off my face. I mean, she <laughs> hit me hard. Now, I've always heard that it is the quiet ones that you have to be aware of. And what I had failed to notice was 
during this time, as all of this was going on, what I had failed to notice was that the whole high school had come out to watch this because they thought that she was coming out to beat up my now present girlfriend. Little did they know she was coming out to beat me up. Now, uh, after that, people would recognize me. Anywhere I went, I would see somebody, and they would be like, hey, you're that guy that Melissa Ferris beat up in the school parking lot. And I said, well, technically, she just hit me once. She really didn't beat me up, but yeah, that's me. That's what I was known for. That's who I was known to be. Now, right after it happened, I went by and saw her mom. Miss Janice sitting here, my mother-in-law, who's so proud to have me as her son-in-law. I told her what had happened, and all she could do was laugh. That's all she could do was laugh. She said, my Melissa? My sweet, innocent Melissa? My Melissa? As she was laughing uncontrollably. And so... <laughs> And as I seen I was going to get no sympathy there, I left. Now, later on that year, Melissa came by, and I worked at uh, Hawker Oil, if anybody remembers that. And she ash actually asked me if I would sign her yearbook. That's the first time we had spoken since all of this took place. And she asked me if I would sign her yearbook. Well, before I, would, before I signed it, I decided to read through it. And this is what I seen. My proudest moment, slapping Bobby Page's face. My bravest moment, slapping Bobby Page's face. The craziest thing I ever did. Yes, you guessed it, slapping Bobby Page's face. And boy, was I going to write her a doozy. Man, I was going to let her have it. And then I read this. Best kiss. Bobby Page. First love, Bobby Page. Best looking, Bobby Page. Okay, maybe I made that one up, but you know, I, I was on a roll. I, I was really moving with that. So I decided to write her a nice note, and the rest is history. Uh, we were engaged in December, we were married in June, and we've been married for 31 years. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much. But I knew when she, she beat the tar out of me, I had to marry her. I just, she could be, she could protect me. Um, <laughs> but this is, Can I add one thing. Add one thing. <laughs> I'm glad she's enjoying this so much. But this is the point, and, and, and just so you know, I asked my wife permission to, get, to tell that story because I know for a long time she hated that story. Now she, uh, she finds way too much pleasure in it now, but for years she hated that story. She didn't like it, but she's kind, it's kind of grown attached to her. So, um, but I asked permission, but you know, even the quiet ones have a boiling point. Even the quiet ones have a limit on how far they can be pushed before all of that that they've, they've held inside of them, all of that anger and all of the mistreatment and all that begins to build up until it overflows and, and God help the one that it overflows on. Uh, you see, people have this crazy notion that because God has been silent for almost 2,000 years that He's forgotten. He's forgotten about us forgotten his warnings, forgotten about his judgments that's supposed to come. But even God will reach that boiling point. And today Peter's going to discuss that. Second Peter chapter 3. And we'll start with verse 3, but we'll start our discussion with verse 5. 3 through 13. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant 
of that. By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in the all-holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we account to his promise and look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, verse 5, Peter starts out by saying, For this they are willingly ignorant. Not that they don't have the evidence, not that they haven't heard the truth, but they choose to be ignorant about this subject. The argument, Peter comes with his argument against uniformitarianism. If you remember, as we talked about last week, uniformitarianism is the idea that, that, that the things have always evolved and things have always come forward. It's the whole idea of evolution. It's a whole thing, and they have to deny any catastrophic event in order for uniformitarianism to have any hope. They have to deny creation. They have to deny the flood. They have to deny all of those things, regardless of, of what the evidence says, regardless of what science finds, regardless of what they dig up out of the earth. They have to deny those catastrophic events in order for uniformitarianism to, to be true. Now, the first that Peter begins to talk about, he says... That by creation, by the word of God, a creation began. God instantly brought the universe into existence from nothing. He created everything from nothing. And he didn't need millions of years to do it. He created it in a literal six days, six 24-hour days. Now he says, it was of long ago. Now that does not mean millions of years when he says long ago. I don't know about you, but a few thousand years would warrant the term long ago. Kind of like the story of Melissa Ali was a long time ago to me. You'll get that in a minute. Standing out of the water, standing in the water. The Bible teaches us that God made the earth between two areas of water. Genesis chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 say this, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. So there was a lower layer of water, there was an upper layer of water. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now, on day two of creation... He collected the upper waters 
into some kind of, of water canopy, some type of vapor canopy that completely encircled the earth. Now, the lower waters went into the rivers, they went into the lakes, they went into the streams, they went into the oceans, they went into the seas, and they went into an underground water reservoir. And then on the third day, he separated the land from the waters. And then Genesis 1.10 says, And God saw it, and it was good. Now, somehow this water canopy, this water canopy that, that completely engulfed the earth, protected Adam and Eve and all of the descendants up to the flood. It protected them from the sun's harmful rays. And they lived a lot longer than we live. They lived many hundreds of years longer than we lived. The Bible teaches us that Adam was 130 years old when he passed away. 930 years old in Genesis 5.5. And then the Bible teaches us that their descendants became very wicked. They became very wicked. So wicked that God had decided to destroy the whole earth. All but eight people. Can you imagine? All but eight people were wicked. Now, the world that Peter mentions here in verse 6 is, is not speaking of the earth, but speaking of the people that were upon the earth, because the earth was not destroyed. It was cleansed. It was washed. Now, the word that was translated flooded, we get the word cataclysm from it. Completely destroyed. Complete destructive overflow. Completely annihilated cataclysm now one of the arguments that that these skeptics have about the flood is that there wouldn't be enough water okay let's break this down first and foremost right off the bat the earth is covered by two-thirds two-thirds of the earth is covered by water so right there two-thirds of his or three-fourths of his job is already completed Three-fourths of the earth is already covered in water. So now we need to justify the one-fourth that is left. In Genesis 1-7, it literally says that God supported the waters above the waters below. God supported the waters above the waters that were below. There was some type of support that kept that canopy of vapors or of water or whatever it was that completely surrounded the earth. And so you had the waters above and the fountains of the great deep that were below. Genesis 7:11 says, God opened the floodgates of the water canopy and it caused all the springs of the deep to, birth, to burst, burst forth. And the remaining one-fourth was covered. He opened the floodgates of the canopies, and he opened the floodgates of the springs that were below to completely cover the earth. Now, I heard a story the other day that while they were doing a fossil dig, and as they were going through the millions and millions of years of layers of fossils, that right in the middle of that, those layers of millions of years of fossils, they found an upright tree. And they can't figure out how it got there. How in the world did that upright tree make it through all those millions and millions of years of layers? It was as if there was a sudden sediment settle or something that went on, that something that happened. How do you, how do you explain finding a, a, a whale skeletons thousands of miles inland. You know how they explain it? Whales had legs. You're laughing, but that's what they, that, that's the explanation they came up with, is that whales had four legs and they walked onto land. There you go. These huge mammals walked into the center of dry land and that's why we have whale 
skeletal remains thousands of miles into land. Listen, at the end of the flood, God made a promise. He made a covenant with Noah that he would never again destroy the earth with water. Genesis 9, 11. But, look at verse 7 again. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly man. Not water, but fire. The earth will never again be destroyed by water, but by fire. Once again, where is all this fire coming from? Well, first off, the galaxy is filled with billions of burning stars. Billions of burning stars. So there we have fires from the heavens. And you do realize there's only a 10-mile crust that separates us from 12,400 degree Fahrenheit molten core. A 10-mile crust is all that separates us from the center of the earth. Now, let's not forget about the fact that we ourselves have created enough nuclear weapons to destroy ourselves. So it wouldn't be hard to imagine that fire would come and destroy the earth. That would destroy everything upon the earth. So, when God is ready, he has all he needs. When God is ready. Now, as I say that, you know, he spoke creation into existence. He could just speak creation out of existence. Unexistence, if you would. Uncreation. He could do that. But that's not how he says it'll be done. But listen, always remember this. Judgment is received, is reserved for the wicked. God will deliver the righteous. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16 through 18 says this, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention and he heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day so just in case you haven't figured this out Peter wants to make sure that you know this one fact that God's perspective on time is completely different than our microwave fast food instant oatmeal mentality completely different what seems like a long time to us oh let's say a thousand years to him is actually a short day, like one day. One day to the Lord. You see, God is not bound by the boundaries of time like we are. 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 70 years of life, give or take. And only about 50 of those years are productive, give or take. Boundaries. Boundaries always cause us to be in a hurry because of time limits. Every day, time limits. The bank closes at 5.30. Town and country closes at 10. Pizza Hut closes at 10. Taxes have to be done by April 15th. Bills have to be paid by the first of the month. Sunday school starts at 10, and it has to end at 11. 
time restrictions. Everywhere we go, every single day, we are bound by time restrictions. God determined in eternity past the very moment that Jesus will return. And nothing will stop that. There is no time. There is no restrictions that will stop that. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You want to know why God has not come back yet? It's because there's lost people out there who need Him first. I have a son out there who doesn't know the Lord, and God is waiting on him. That's why he hasn't come back. It's because there are those out there who are lost and are dying and are going to hell. That's why he's not come back. But know this. There's a time coming when people will become so wicked that no one else will be saved. And then, and only then, listen, God delivered four people out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Four people. He delivered eight people out of the flood. And He will deliver the righteous out of the final judgment of fire. Now, the word slow here means delayed or late. You see, he has set a time, and obviously that time has not come. So he's not late. He's not delayed. If I tell you that I'll meet you at 5, I'm not late, and I'm not delayed if it's only 4.30. God set a time, and he is not late. You see, when Christ came the first time, He was right on schedule. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. There is a time, there is a schedule. When He comes the second time, He will be right on schedule. He is not late, but long-suffering. Some translations say he is patient. He is patient. Now, the word long-suffering or the word patient that is translated here is a compound word. It's two words that they put together. And the two different words, one means large, and the other word means great anger. Large and great anger. What Peter is saying is that God has this incredible ability to store up anger. He has this incredible ability to store up wrath, to store it up. And just like my ex-girlfriend at the time, Missy Tyson, had finally had enough, and her wrath finally spilled over into a right uppercut into my jaw, she had finally spilled over. And just as that happens, God's wrath will be poured out on the wicked when enough is enough. And listen, it's not God's will that any should suffer. It's not God's will that any should suffer. His will is that all would come to repentance. That's what he tells us, that all would come to repentance. So listen to me, never give up on the lost. Never give up on the lost. God hasn't, and listen, remember the evidence is on our side. Remember that. When you listen to the scoffers, when the scoffers come, listen, the evidence is on our side. When they deny creation, when they deny the flood, remember the evidence is on our side. 
They may look at the evidence, they may see the evidence, they may deny the evidence, but the evidence is still there nonetheless. And show me a whale with four legs. Because they, my friend, as Peter said, are willingly ignorant. They are willingly ignorant. Father, thank you. Thank you for this word. God, we thank you that you are patient towards the wicked. You are patient towards the lost. That you have reserved judgment and you have held back and you have stored up the anger and the wrath, as Peter said. Because there are lost people out there, God, that you know that in the right time they're going to change, that they're going to give their life to you. And God, I pray that you never give up on him. God, for all of us here who have lost loved ones, God, as we pray for them, God, help us to be diligent. God, help us to never stop praying. God, you, you gave, him, gave me my dad through long prayers. God, you gave me my mom through diligence. God, I thank you for that. Now, Father, as we conclude this service, I pray you give us opportunities, God. Give us opportunities to share this love. To share this love to a lost and dying world. And God, may many be brought into the fold because of who we are and because of who we represent. And Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' very precious name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.